Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for our workers' meeting. Thank you for your people. Thank you for their faithfulness. And thank you for this work in our hands. We're praying, Lord, that this work will prosper in every one of our hands in Jesus' name. Amen. Every worker, every section, use us to be a blessing to your people in Jesus' name. Amen. And as you are using your people as channels of blessings, we pray that your blessings will flow into every worker's life, every worker's family, every leader's family. And the great desires of their hearts will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. Once again, we pray that you will not be hearers of the word only, we'll be doers of the world. And the blessing of obedience will follow every life. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. We're looking at um, today, we're looking at Romans chapter 12. Actually, this is not just an interesting chapter. It is an enlightening chapter, and it is something that has the commandments of the Lord. And it's not something we should just read and pass by. Many of these things we have heard before. But I pray that the Lord will renew our understanding in these passages in Jesus' name. Romans chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 9. It says, let love be without dissimulation. Have you tried to find out that word, dissimulation? It means without deception without hypocrisy and without any deceit at all let love be without dissimulation let it be without deceit without double dealing without duplicity without hypocrisy without pretense without ostentation it's not something i want to do this i want to do that i'm blowing a trumpet without ulterior motive, without saying, I want to plant this so I can reap that. Let love be without dissimulation. Let it be, or let it not be without showmanship. And then it goes on in that uh, verse 9. It says, abhor that which is evil. It may shun that which is evil. Reject that which is evil. Jettison that which is evil and totally abandon that which is evil. Then it says, cleave to that which is good. That is, be wedded to that which is good. Be joined to that which is good. Let that which is good become part of your life. That you know that you and goodness, you are wedded together, you are married together as a wife, cleaves to the husband and the husband cleaves to the wife let goodness cleave unto you and it says in verse 10 be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love it says there should be kindness coming out of our hearts there should be compassion coming out of our hearts and then it goes on to say it should be with brotherly love and it should be as if you were born in the same biological family as if you were born by the same mother brotherly love the love of the brethren actually you are redeemed by the same blood of jesus christ which is thicker and stronger and greater than the natural blood and then he goes on to say in honor tell me preferring one another it says you should make it a practice actually when we were younger in our secondary school age days they used to tell us that if a man and a woman if you had to pass through a particular door they said ladies first women first and now we say sisters first it means that in honor you prefer other people you and another brother you prefer that brother you and another sister you prefer that sister you make that a principle and you make that a practice and you do it so often and you do it so regularly it becomes part of you it says that will show that we're actually having the kindness i'm coming to verse 13 it says distributing to the necessity of the saints distributing to the necessity of the saints that is you cut down your own luxury so that you can meet the need of other people what is necessary basic important essential indispensable in the lives of other people you're not living in such a way that you are so comfortable and you feel so convenient and you are living in luxury and you are living in abundance when your neighbor your brother your sister a member of the family of god when he has nothing 
and when is going hungry and when is being deprived in life and you are living in luxury it says that you will give to the necessity of the brethren and says it says uh, giving to hospitality you know hospitality eh? that means uh, when people see you at least to start with a cup of cold water at least you have some little things you're able to give them the people that see you the people that visit you they're not going to you know we're brothers and sisters and he wouldn't mind whether he minds or not this is a commandment of scripture and it says we distribute to the necessity of others and then we have hospitality look at verse 15 it says rejoice of them that do you rejoice the thing may not interest you but the thing interests him the thing may not excite you, but it excites him. Maybe you've married long, long ago, and then you've forgotten how it feels when people newly get, uh, when they get married, and then they are excited, they are happy, and then you see him, and he's having, you know, kind of this uh, exuberant joy. You say, what's happening to you? I got married. Uh-huh. I got married to you 40 years ago because you've forgotten how it feels it says don't think about how you feel look at that person rejoicing it's passed an exam it's got a certificate it's got something new and it says that you rejoice with them that do rejoice and then it says weep with them tell me that weep it's just lost somebody he's lost somebody and you understand because uh, you know it doesn't affect you you are a child of god and uh, this person has just lost his wife and then you see him during his service or after the service and he's looking sad looking unhappy looking dejected say my brother maybe you've not heard what happened and then he tells you you know i, I just lost my wife or i lost my husband was she a believer yes or say believer yes he's gone to heaven and says he's gone to heaven aren't you happy that your wife has gone to heaven is that not what we're all praying for that god make me ready i want to be ready and she was ready and she left and that's that's why you're happy come on now cheer up we don't do that even jesus wept he knew he was going to raise up lazarus but when he got to the grave of lazarus first of all he groaned he was sad with him and then he wept and the people said see how much he loved him and we need to weep with the people that we rejoice with the people that rejoice in verse 16 it says be of the same mind one toward another mind north high things but condescend to men of low estate that is you shouldn't carry your certificate on your forehead you shouldn't carry your position on your face you shouldn't carry your exaltation in the world all around and the people who are low the people who are jobless the people who are not as high as yourself you identify with them that's what he's saying here actually these are commandments and commandments are meant to be obeyed it's not just that we read through but you know if we're not doers of the work the lord wants us to be doers first the people that practice before the people that preach that's why it's saying that we should be of the same mind one with another that means get under their skin and feel the way they feel and see what they see and go through what they're what they're going through and then it says mind not high things but condescend bring yourself low to men and women to brothers and sisters of low estate and it says be not wise in your own conceits you know there are people they say they are christians i hope so but you know as we interact together and as we meet together their opinion must always be number one their ideas must always be accepted another person is not wise every other person is foolish every other person is ignorant they are the only people that know it says you don't be wise in your own conceit don't deceive yourself and think that you are the only wise solomon and the rest of us are ignorant people don't do that even if you have an idea suspend that even if you have a suspend that even if you have an idea put that aside and say i prefer that brother i prefer that sister give them chance to talk 
You know, sometimes I discover in our local churches, um, at least I know what happens uh, at the combined service. I watch people. You know, sometimes you'll we'll say, uh, this is the first question, and then the teacher reads out the question, and if you want to answer, and I always see a particular person, I don't want to say brother or sister, so that you'll not guess who I'm talking about, and that person always comes out. I appreciate the fact that the person knows the Bible, the person knows the scriptures, and the person has actually read the thing, but all the time coming out, and then if you have any question after we've finished this other scripture, and there's somebody that always coming out at the combined service of those people and then you are wondering why is he always having a question and sometimes when he asks the question it's going to be a personal thing do not be wise young conceit give chance to other people so that we know that this is a fellowship this is an assembly this is a congregation and then he has something to say she has something to say I have something to contribute and then we're sharing together and then I come now to verse 20 there Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If uh, he thirst, give him drink. Before I go on to the rest of that verse, you know, sometimes we allow other people to change us. They will forget the scripture. There are hundreds, I'm going to say, there are thousands, I'm going to say, there are hundreds of thousands of people church going people in this our country that they have changed the concept and the understanding of what the lord wants us to do towards our enemies and they have their prayer books and they have all the system and there are people that have bought into their prayer system and it's to destroy the enemies and it's to kill the enemies is to be bitter against those enemies they are hindering me they're stopping me they're not allowing me to make the progress i need to make let this happen to them let them die let so if anything happen to them and they had they say okay god is answering my prayer no, that's not going to answer your prayer because that prayer is against the Bible. It's against the word of God. And there may be many people among us who are bought into that lie, who are bought into that deception, that instead of praying positively for the people that actively hate us, we're praying negatively and we're wishing negative, we're discerning something negative against them. Come back to the scriptures. It says, therefore, you know the meaning of therefore? Because of the love of God in your heart, and because of what grace of God has come to you, it says, therefore, because of all this thing that was studied, and because of eternity, it says, therefore, if thine enemy hunger, do what? Feed him. If he thirst, tell me, give him drink. Then it says, for in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil. Be not overcome of evil. When people do evil to you and then you retaliate, you are overcome of that evil. That evil they have done, the action they have taken, you know, that action has destroyed your Christian life and destroyed your Christian perception. But it says, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with, with good, with kindness, with graciousness and with the life of Christ. I want to examine this uh, passage with you on the believer's reflection of Christ's love. The believer's reflection of Christ's love. What that means is that the love of Christ comes to you and then that love of Christ will reflect that from your heart. You don't reflect the human nature. You don't reflect your human desires but you reflect the nature of Christ and the love of Christ and the light of Christ. The believer's reflection of Christ's love. One attribute and um, one character of Christ which is unique and which has been from all eternity and will continue till all eternity is love. And that love comes in our heart comes into our personality and then affects us and influences us. All believers have tasted of this love because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son 
that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life and that love is shared abroad in our heart and is to flow from us and flow to other people what people know about us first shall not be our knowledge should be our love what people know about us first should not be our tribe, should be our love. What people know about us first is not our doctrine. You know, I believe this, I believe that, should be our love. Because this love of God is shared abroad in our heart. It is a birthmark. What we call a birthmark, you know, sometimes you see a brother, you see a sister, has a particular mark on the face. And it wasn't that uh, the parents uh, did that. It just, that's the way the person was born. We call it a birthmark. And love should be the birthmark that will carry through to eternity. The believer's reflection of Christ's love. There are three things we're going to consider. Number one, reviving costly love among the flock costly love love that is costly costly love reflect uh, reviving costly love among the flock number two renewing compassionate love within the fellowship renewing it it's been there and sometimes it gets dormant sometimes it gets forgotten sometimes some other attributes or attitudes cover that love up but you remove all the debris and all the dirty things that cloud that and you renew compassionate love within the fellowship. Now, number three, reflecting courageous love. Reflecting courageous love toward our foes. Towards our foes. The foes are the enemies. The foes are the opposers. The foes are the people that contradict. The foes are the people that try to hurt us. The foes are the people that try to hinder us. Reflecting courageous love towards our foes. You see, I've never heard of courageous love. Yes, there's courageous love. Courageous love. A mother is going up with a child and they're about to cross the road. And the child mistakenly has gone before the mother. And a car is coming. All of a sudden, the mother sees that and sees that that uh, car may crush that child. And because of the love of the mother, she rushes there, picks up the child, and then dashes up the road. That's courageous love. Other people will not be able to do that. They'll be mindful of their lives. They'll be mindful of their safety. They see the car coming. If I go there, I don't know what will happen, but the mother has courageous love. And you know, if you're going to love your enemies, it's going to take some courage because uh, he's bragging, he's boasting, he's pointing the finger at you. He doesn't hide his hatred. And yet, the Lord said, show him love. Show him who God is. And show him the power of love. And that's going to take courage when you overlook what he has said. You overlook what he's doing. And then you show the love of Christ. Reflecting courageous love towards our foes. Point number one. Tell me number one there. God bless you. Reviving costly love among the flock. We're coming back to Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Let it be transparent. Let it be real. Don't have any show and don't have any kind of make believe. And don't just say something you don't mind. Be factual. Be truthful, be sincere, be honest, and let the love be real. That's why it says, let love be without dissimulation. As you, as you interact with people and they seem to practice what they call love, many times you'll see that people have ulterior motives. Many times people are dishonest. And many times, people are insincere. Many times, people do not actually have that love of Christ flowing from their heart and flowing to people because they pretend, because they are hypocritical, because the things they show 
and the six the deal they want to do this so that you'll give them this uh-uh that one has ulterior motive they want to do this so that you'll think well of them that has ulterior motive it says let your love be christ kind of love let it be costly love and let it be something that comes from here and comes to the people without any duplicity and without any deception and without any hypocrisy and without any pretense and without any ulterior motive asking for something or looking for something such love does not count the cost such love does not count because it is calvary love it is christ-like love it is costly love and uh, it is a kind of love that is shed abroad in our heart and we just want to help the people we're not thinking of ourselves that kind of love is only thinking about the need of that brother and the need of that sister and the need that i need to supply that i need to meet and even though it costs me something it might cost him nothing isn't that the love of christ it cost him his very life it cost him his very blood. It cost him to shed all that he had from eternity and to lay all that aside and then to show that love to us when we meant nothing to him, when we would not pay back anything at all. Is the costly love of Calvary that we're only thinking of the need of the brother, we're only thinking of the need of the sister, and we're not thinking of the pain it may cost us because of that we visit. Because of that, we give. Because of that, we help. Because of that, we pray for people. Because of that, we support. We support the people that need our support. And because of that, we bear the bodies of other people. And we bear the bodies until their problems are solved. Until all the heartache they have, all the sicknesses they have, all the challenges they have, until all those problems are solved. That's the cost. It costs you something. And then you are not counting the cost. I've done this and the problem is still not solved. Keep on doing it until the problem is solved. This love does not attach any unattainable condition. The people that they want to do something. Uh, somebody wants to lend you 100,000 naira. And then he says, you must come and give me a guarantee of 80,000 naira. My friend, if that person had 80,000 naira, he'll not be looking for 100,000 naira. They're so near each other. You're giving an unattainable condition. Okay, I'm going to do this for you, but you must do this first and you must uh, you know pour down some water so that i can march on refresh take ground you're giving some condition that the fellow may not be able to attain obtain therefore the love we're talking about is this costly love is this christ-like love and it is this calvary love that doesn't have any unattainable condition attached to it it is not the kind of love that someone has to earn by marriage you know there are people before they can love you you have to earn it you have to earn it you have to be so good hypersensitively good before they'll smile at you and say that's nice you're getting better now i can love you because i see that you are better it is not something we earn by merit we're talking of the cause what it cost jesus christ to go to the cross of calvary and to die for us are you mentioning your love like that who are the people you love in the fellowship who are the people you interact with in the fellowship are they the people that say what you want them to say that do what you want them to do that dress the way you want them to dress that dots your eye and crosses your t i did the people that satisfy you in every detail that's no more love you're just rewarding them for what they have what they are paid for or what they are paid for you're giving back to them but we're talking of the costly love that it is not by merit the cost is not on the side of the receiver the cost is on the side of the giver. And that's the love of Christ. The love of Christ cost him something, cost him his life. But we receive that love without paying for it. The cost of salvation is not on our side. 
the cost of eternal life is not on our side the cost of the goodness of god the grace of god is not on our side the cost is on the side of the lord himself the same thing with the cost of we're talking about that cost is not on the recipient the one receiving that love the cause is on the side of the person who is giving that love. This love, Christ-like love, constant love, practical love, helpful love, it is that we give to people. Now, how we need such love renewed and revived in our midst. As in the good old days when we started the house fellowship, people just ran to the house fellowship. Because the house fellowship was new. The house fellowship was fresh. And because of that, we, just, we visited people. Were you there at that time? I said, were you there at that time? Maybe we even visited you. And said, so see how these people love. And you've been going to other churches before. We didn't even tell you, leave your church or leave whatever. We didn't preach against your church. But we just said, they love me like this. And this happened. See what they did for me. See what they bought for me. That love will come back. And when that love comes back, you will not think of the distance it will take you to reach that person. You will not think of uh, the sweat you have to go through before you touch the life of that person. It's the costly love of Jesus Christ coming from you. And that's exactly what Christ expects that we should have. We're looking at John chapter 15. John chapter 15. I'm reading here from verse 12. John chapter 15 and i'm reading here from verse 12 it says in verse 12 this is my commandment that she love one another as i have loved you as i have loved you i see some people nowadays the way they love is that okay the way he has loved me he overlooked me i'll overlook him he didn't greet me why should i greet him he didn't, uh, you know, even talk to me. Why should I talk to him? And he said, they are Christians. But Jesus said, it's not what they do. And it is not how they act. And it is not their action or their attitude towards you. If you are willing, if you are waiting until the world smiles, I feel before you smile, you'll never smile. You'll never smile. Because, you see, we we'll see them on the street. We we'll see them in the bars. We we'll see them everywhere. They're carrying such heavy load on them that they never smile. If you are waiting for them to smile before you smile back at them, you will never smile. But when you originate it, when you initiate it, when you get it started, like Jesus Christ got it started. If Jesus waited for the world to invite him before he came, he would never have come. If God waited for the world to demand for that love or show some love, he would never have come. But God so loved the world when we were yet his enemies. God manifested that love unto us and is telling us here this is my commandment that she love one another as I have loved you. Look at verse 13. Greater love has no man than this. This costly love. Costly love. Greater man, greater love has no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends will do it in jesus name you say how do you lay something down for all the people i'm looking at job chapter 29 job chapter 29 i'm reading here from verse 11 it says when the ear heard me then it blessed me and when the eye saw me it gave witness to me because this is the reason why i delivered the poor that cried that's the love practical love costly love i delivered the the poor that cried and the father and the fatherless and him that uh, that had none to help him i helped them the blessing of him uh, that was ready to perish came uh, upon me you see that you see that they are ready to perish with hunger they are ready to perish with thirst they are ready to perish of their need and then it says the blessing of him uh, that was ready to perish came uh, upon me and i caused the widow a heart the widow's heart tell me you tell me out aloud. Uh huh. Sick now in your local church. Any widow there? I don't know. You don't know because you didn't find out. The widows are there. They've lost their husbands. 
they lost, they lost the breadwinner in the family. And yet nobody is thinking of them. I come to church, they come to church, we come to church, you know, we do the singing, we do the uh, preaching, we hear everything, and then praise the Lord, we pray, and then we go. All we're asking for now, Lord, give me this, give me this, give me this. And the widow is there, we're not taking care of the fatherless are there, we're not taking care of the oppressed are there, we're not taking care of them. Church continues, fellowship continues, preaching continues, ministry continues, but we're not doing what Job said here here that he did and we will begin to do this i said we'll begin to do this look at verse 14 he said i put on righteousness and it closed me and my judgment is said was as a robe and a diadem i was tell me now tell me out loud I was eyes to the blind and the blind man did not feel he was blind because I said I'll supply that need I was eyes to the blind where the blind would have gone and he wish if I had somebody to take me there I said I'm here I'm here I'll take you there and then where the lame would have gone and he didn't know where to go because you know I don't have any legs I cannot move like other people I said I'm here I'll be legs for you look at that verse again it says I was eyes to the blind and uh, tell me Feet was I to the lame. Feet was I to be lame. Job said, I can't perform a miracle and open the eyes of the blind, but I give myself as a servant to those blind people and I'll take them where they ought to go. I cannot perform a miracle to make the lame to rise up and walk, but I will make sure that I supply that need. I'll become their legs and then I will take them to where they ought to go. That's what the Lord is requesting of us. And that's what the Lord is saying that will manifest this costly love and this practice love it will be done I'm looking at Job chapter 31 Job chapter 31 and we're reading from verse 16 Job chapter 31 verse 16 it says if I have withheld the poor from their desire or have caused the eyes of the widow to fail or if I have eaten my muscle myself alone it says the food I have, and you know he had many children, and yet he said, I didn't eat my food alone. I was always having something to give out to the people that were hungry. This is a practical love, and this is the Christian love, Christ-like love, costly love, that the Lord is demanding from us. He says, so I'm eating my muscle, myself alone. Or the fatherless has not eaten thereof. He said, I will search for them. I look for them. And if they will not come to me, I go to them. And that's what the Lord is asking us to do. That the fatherless who are there, there's nobody to pay their school fees. Somebody is searching them out. Are they dropping out of school? We get them back to school. Are they ejected out of accommodation? And God has blessed us. And we have something that can pay for the accommodation. Costly love, we're going to do it in Jesus name or they are jobless if we don't have any job to give them we're supporting them we're sustaining them and then it says in verse 19 in verse 19 or if I have seen any perish for want of clothing or any poor without covering if his loins have not blessed me and if he were not warmed with the fleece of my sheep. And then he goes on like that. He's telling us what we ought to do. That the love we're talking about is not just, you know, we study it in the Bible, we read it in the Bible, and after reading in the Bible, then we forget all about it. He said, no, it must go on. I to flow through you and flow through me in Jesus' name. He's telling us in uh, Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16, uh, I'm reading from verses 3 and 4. Romans chapter 16 verses 3 and 4 tells us the manifestation of the law that Paul the Apostle had to comment about. It says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, help us in Christ Jesus. Help us. Paul the Apostle said, I saw help. I received help. You remember Paul the Apostle? Paul the Apostle was the person that says, I have learned. 
in whatever state I am there to be content. I know how to abound. I know how to be a base. Everywhere I'm taught, I could be hungry and I would not mind. And I could be full and I would not mind. And the people did not say, well, Paul, he doesn't, he doesn't need food. Paul, he doesn't need water. Even if you give him, he tell you that I've lunch, whatever state I am, to be content, let him go hungry. That's the attitude of some people. Or you say, that man doesn't care for clothing. That man doesn't care for, you know, food. That man doesn't care and he's always cheerful. Whether he has or he doesn't have, he's uh, learned how to endure everything. Uh, and yet, they don't give you anything. And this Paul, the apostle said, I'm greeting uh, Priscilla. I'm greeting Aquila. You know what he did? Look at verse for. In verse 4 it says, Who have for my life laid down their own necks unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. It says, it's not only myself. We all know them. That family, they just care for people. That family, they just splash costly love upon people. I pray we'll be like that in Jesus' name. And then our love will be something pure, something enriching, something fervent, something not hidden, something obvious. We're looking at First Peter chapter one verse twenty-two. First Peter chapter one verse twenty-two. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love. That's it. Unpretending love, a, a love that is not hypocritical not dishonest, a love that is transparent unto unfeigned love of the brethren. And then he goes on to say that ye love one another with a pure heart. Tell me the last word there. Fervently. He says we shall love each other fervently. Not the kind of love we are ditching out. You know, we're, we're measuring it. Then we give a little peace. And then if the person is still waiting, that's not enough. And then we give a little peace. And if that's not enough, then we give a little peace. And we dole it out like we're giving Kobo and uh, five naira peace, uh, something to the beggar. Not something like that. But something from all your heart. And it expression of love something that comes from the depth of your heart and is flowing out to them and you do it exactly you do it happily and you do it fervently i come to point number two it says a renewing compassionate love within the fellowship we're coming back to romans chapter 12 Romans chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 13. Romans chapter 12, reading from verse 13, over here in verse 13. What does it say? Look at your Bible. Romans chapter 12, verse 13. It says in verse 13, distributing to the necessity of saints, giving to hospitality. That word, that word given means you are abandoned to hospitality. It means you give yourself to hospitality. It's like you forget yourself in hospitality. You forget yourself in doing good. You just do good and do good and do good. You're addicted to doing good. Like some of the people are addicted to drugs. They're addicted to alcohol. They're addicted to beer. You're addicted to goodness. Good, doing good to all people. You are abandoned to hospitality. It tells us in verse 15, in verse 15, rejoice with them that to rejoice, be excited with the people who are excited in life and rejoice with the people. They have something that happened to them and they are happy. Rejoice with them. Now, in life you'll find those who are always moody, those who are always morose, those who are always sad. They say that's their nature. I don't think that's their nature. I think uh, all the things that happened in life just beclouded them, just made them blind to excitement in life. And they have nothing to rejoice about. Then there are other people that are excited, they are happy, and life is okay with them. And there are some people, they look at those two groups and they say, this one are my people. They must have the same load and the same burden and the same oppression that I have. I think I'll join these people. Don't join them. Be excited in life. You have a lot to praise God for. I said you have a lot to praise God for. 
the love of Christ is there, the salvation of the Lord is there, eternal life is there, inheritance in heaven is there, and the opportunity to serve the Lord is there, be excited. And then it says, you see all the people that are rejoicing, join them and rejoice with them. Then it goes on to say, and weep with them that weep, and be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Tell me the rest there. Be not wise in your own conceits. There are people that are no, no more teachable, no more amenable to teaching, and no more submissive to teaching. It's like, you know, this is what they are doing, and this is what they will always do. It's like there's no change that can come in their lives. They've made up their minds that this is the direction I'm going, and that's the wisest thing I will do. There's no teaching, there is no doctrine, and there's no preaching that will change them. It says, don't do that. Be not wise in your own conceit. You hear the word of God, like the word you are hearing now, you go back to your district, go back home, and you are going to do something you've never done before. You are going to search for the widows. Maybe you've not been doing that. You are going to search for the fatherless, and you are going to help people, and then all those shoes that are just lying yours, you've not worn them for five years, bring them out and give them out. All those clothes you are just hanging there, there are people that have nothing to use, and those things are there, and they're just getting they're destroyed over there. Bring them out, dry clean them, and then if you have to make announcements, you don't have to, but you can look for people Paul, and next Sunday will be a day of distribution. Amen. Give me a good amen. amen. It's good to distribute tracks. I bought distributing rice. It's wonderful to distribute tracks. I bought distributing clothes. It's wonderful to distribute, you know, the word of life and this track. And we're going about it. But how about in our church? And we look at all these people and then we say, today is going to be a day of distribution. Close distribution. Give me a good amen. amen. And food distribution. Give me a good amen. amen. Only when we're going for the retreat, we'll make announcement. We need to buy rice. We need to buy this and buy this and buy that. And then we all contribute money. And then we give to the people. Then we tell our friends who are inviting to the retreat. Only from Thursday night to Sunday, we say there is free food. Many of our own people who are with us, apart from retreat time, they don't have enough to eat. Why don't we get a one Sunday rice distribution Sunday? Tell me a good amen. And then there is a Gary distribution Sunday. This distribution Sunday, and then we came to church uh, that day, and we say, "Wait, don't go. We're going to have a kind of distribution today because the love of God is flowing in our heart." You know, I'm eating too much. I'm taking too much. My brothers and sisters have nothing to eat, and we're going to take part of what we have. We're going to give to them in Jesus' name, and that's why it's saying here: "It says, be not wise in your own conceit." And compassionate love is uh, spontaneous love. It is not a forced law. It is not an administrative force. That is, it is not by administration. And we're not driven by an external stimulus. It does not wait for order. does not wait for a commandment before we offer to help other people. There are people that are saying, because they didn't tell us to, or the Bible tells you to. Did you command us to do that? The Holy Spirit commands you to do that. I didn't know that I could give anything to the people in need. Christ already said so. And Christ already said, this is what to do. And the word of God we are studying here are the commandments of God. And it says, this is what to do. We don't need, we don't need somebody to coordinate this one. Administration for this one. We don't need somebody to tell us and push us and force us to that. It is our nature. It's our nature. And that that nature will flow through you in Jesus' name. The love of God flowing through us and getting to the lives of other people and people say, I'm happy I'm a Christian. I'm happy I'm a member of this church. I'm happy. I wasn't even thinking of this. I just wanted to go to church. I said, even if I have to die in church, I will die with the Lord. And then as I made up my mind and consecrated myself that I will die serving the Lord, somebody just gave me something. And then, you know, we came out of some, put something in my hand. 
when did I see 10,000 naira last in my life? And this person just said, brother, how are you? I thought you wanted to shake my hand and then drop 10,000 in my hand. Drop 50,000 in my hand. You know, somebody, somebody said, what's your account? And you know, these are not dubious people. You know, these people that ask him for your bank account, uh, you know, bank uh, account number. And then you give them and then the following day, they send you a large that somebody transferred 35,000 to your account. Me? When last did I see that? That's what we're talking about. That we surprise them with the love of God. And that love, compassionate love, will continue to flow in our lives in Jesus' name. And this is the free flow of the mercy of God, of the compassion of the Lord to those people who are in need. And then it's like rain coming from heaven. And like showers coming from heaven. And it comes upon their hearts in a dry and weary land. God is love and Christ always moved with compassion where Christ lives unhindered, unrestricted and not constrained that same love will flow from our hearts towards them in Jesus name and let's look at the Acts of the Apostles chapter 9 Acts of the Apostles chapter 9 I'm reading from verse 39 Acts of the Apostles chapter 9 verse 39 and let's see the manifestation of this uh, love acts 9 verse 39 it says in verse 39 then peter arose and went with them when he was come they brought him unto the upper chamber and all the widows stood by him weeping and showing up the coats and the garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. You see that? Peter was not there. Peter didn't make any announcement. The apostle was not there to make any announcement. All of his, all of her own, these dockers, the clothes and the garments and the needs of the people of the widows there just kept on giving out and giving out and giving out. And I pray that the Lord will help you. You'll have this in mind. Let this might be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. How the Lord just gave himself to the people. How he expects you to give yourself to the people. Acts of the Apostles chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 35. Acts chapter 20, we're reading from verse 35. I have showed you all things. How that so laboring ye ought to support the weak support the weak not criticize the weak support the weak not put pressure on the weak support the weak not um, you know do anything negative to the weak but support the weak and then and to remember the words of the lord jesus how he said tell me out loud it is more blessed to give than to receive. Look up here for a moment. Have you seen in all the churches, all denominations in our land, all denominations in our continent of Africa, that we have changed the word of God? It is more blessed to receive than to give. The prayer meetings are like that. The night vigils are like that. And the prosperity preaching, everything is like that. All we want, it is more blessed to receive than to give. And we have raised up, uh, I say we, not me in particular, but you know, all these churches, we have raised up uh, the community or the congregation or the assembly of selfish people, self-centered people, the people that they never think of you know what you need they never think of what other people want it's like it is more pleasant to receive than to give and the richer they are the more they are still demanding and the poorer are becoming poorer and the richer are becoming the rich are becoming richer but the words of jesus christ is it is more blessed tell me to give than to receive when last did you give when last did you do something for other people that are less privileged than yourself for all the people that need some money, they need some clothing, they need some food, they need some accommodation, they need some things in life. When last did you do that? And when last did it cost you so much that you just, you felt it? You know, I need this money, I need this thing, but that my brother needs it more, that my sister needs it more. And because of that, I have to get into this, this compassionate love. And I pray it will start from today. 
in your life it will start in my life it will start and they were giving it out and if you might feel it at the beginning do it again then you feel it do it again and then as you continue as you sow into other people's lives the lord will sow into your life in jesus name galatians chapter 6 i'm reading from verse 10 galatians chapter 6 and i'm reading from verse 10 it says as we have therefore opportunity as we have therefore opportunity let us tell me do good unto all men especially unto them who are of the household of faith it says as we have opportunity hmm, as we have opportunity as we have opportunity the problem is i never have opportunity ah don't tell me that look we're finishing the meeting tonight and as we're finishing don't tell me you don't know that brother is from your local area don't tell me you don't know that sister is from your street and you have a car and only yourself and your wife and the rest of the seats the seats are empty there and then you see that sister standing there that's an opportunity right there an opportunity right there or maybe you don't have a car but you are standing there and the other person is standing here we're just coming from the meeting together and you are waiting for bus or transportation that's an opportunity right there to discuss oh brother how are you what's your name and where do you live where are you going now and what's uh, what's your need and uh, what is this and what is that that's an opportunity right there and it says as we have opportunity let us do let us do what let us do good unto all men, especially now. The people that bear the same name of the Lord Jesus Christ, especially the people that bear the same name of Christianity and the same name of deep life. There are some people, they can do good to uh, somebody they are trying to invite and trying to influence. And then they give to the members of all those other churches. They are trying to win them over. Once they win them over, they abandon them. But there are people who are here. There are people who are deeper life with you. And they have this need and they have this need and they have that need. Especially them of the household of faith. We will do it. Give me a good amen there. Because this is what the Lord is telling us. Look at Jeremiah chapter 38. Jeremiah chapter 38. I'm reading here from verse 7. Jeremiah chapter 38. We're looking at verse 7. And look at the needs of other people. And look at how we meet the needs of other people. Jeremiah chapter 38. And we're looking at verse 7. It says in verse 7 now. When Ebed Melek, the Ethiopian one of the eunuchs which was in the king's house heard that they had put jeremiah in the dungeon the king then sitting in the gate of jerusalem of benjamin rather and it says a bit milik in verse 8 went forth out of the king's house and speak to the king saying my lord the king these men have done evil in all that they have done to jeremiah the prophet whom they have cast into the dungeon and he is like to die for hunger in the place where he is for they, for there is no more bread in the city. Then the king commanded Abed, Abed Melech, the Ethiopian, saying, Take from hence thirty men with thee, and take up Jeremiah the prophet out of the dungeon before he died. You see this? Jeremiah did not approach this person. Because he was in the dungeon. He would have been forgotten there. And this man became concerned that Jeremiah was in the dungeon. And the people that uh, conspired against him had put him there. But he went on his own. He went to speak to the king on his behalf. He said, my lord the king, this Jeremiah will die here. There's no bread in the city. And there's no water there. And if they leave him in that dungeon, the man will die there. You see, that's being a help to another person. A person going through persecution, going through opposition, and going through the attacks of the enemy. And then the king said, go and take how many people? 
30 people, 30 men, and get Jeremiah out of that place. That's the kind of law the Lord is calling us to show to other people. When you see them in danger, you see them in difficulty, you see them in something that's beyond their control, that God will use you. And then you'll be able to bring them out of that place in Jesus' name. We're looking at uh, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 2. Philippians chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 2. It says, Fulfill ye my joy, that she be like-minded, having the same love. That's it. Having the same love, and being of one accord, and of one mind, let nothing be done through. Tell me. Strive for vain glory. A ministry, don't let it be out of strife and vain glory. And our doing good, not out of strife and vain glory. Our working for the Lord, not out of strife and vain glory. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. It's, then it goes on to say, but in lowliness of mind, that's humility, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on the things, of, on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Look for the benefit of other people, for the upliftment of other people, for the encouragement of other people, not for your own benefit or encouragement only. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 3. Hebrews chapter 13, I'm looking at verse 3. Hebrews chapter 13, and we're reading from verse 3. It says, remember them that are in bonds. Any kind of difficulty, any kind of bondage, any kind of sickness, any kind of deprivation, it says, remember them that are in bonds as bound with them. As if you are incarcerated with them. As if you are confined with them. As if you are imprisoned with them. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them. Those that are sick, as if you were sick with them. Those that are jobless, as if you were jobless with them. And those that are going through persecution, as if you are going through that same persecution with them, those that have family problems, wouldn't gossip about them. Ah, look at that brother. And look at that sister. And look at what they are going through. No, we don't gossip. As if you were in that same predicament with them. It says, remember them which are bound, as if you are bound with them. And then it says, and they which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. And that's what we're going to do in Jesus' name. And that is the Christ-like love. That is the, compassion, the compassionate love that he wants us to show in the fellowship. We're coming to point number three now. What's point number three again over there? Reflecting a courageous love towards our foes. And here is where you really now have to understand. Here is the word of God. And that you do not allow the culture of your background or the culture of your tribe or the culture of your nation to influence you. Uh, what's the culture in uh, many nations, in many tribes? That tribe fought against our forefathers about 50, 60, 70 years ago. You are not even born then. And now they transferred that hatred for that tribe. They transferred that to your mind. And they say, we have nothing to do with them. We don't greet them. We don't help them. We don't sit with them. We don't do anything with them. That village and our village, they have nothing in common. They have nothing to do together. They are our sworn enemies. And there's perpetual hatred between them and our family. And they sold that to you. Like Esau sold to the Edomites, to the people of Edom. And they hated Jacob and they hated Israel because of what Jacob had apologized for many years before. And those people still carried that on. If you read the book of Obadiah, Almost the whole of Obadiah is on that. The Edomites, they were, they were vehement enemies of those Israelites. And when we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, all that enmity vanishes away. 
all that tribal enmity vanishes away and a tribal culture everything vanishes away and we do not live according to culture we do not act according to culture ah, we don't marry from that area no we don't uh, do business with those other people we don't interact with those other people if they're christian is they are born again they're children of god we are bought and redeemed and purchased and purified by the blood of the lord jesus christ we are one together and we're united together and it says we must manifest the love towards the people this is courageous love we're coming to romans chapter 12 romans chapter 12 i'm reading from verse 17. romans chapter 12 from verse 17 it says recompense to no man evil for evil provide things honest in the sight of all men it says and if it be possible as much as lies in you live peaceably tell me with all men live peaceably with all men uh -huh. if you cannot live peaceably with your wife how can you live peaceably with all men you can not live peaceably with your mother-in-law how can you live peaceably with all men you cannot live peaceably with members of the church and do so come to the same fellowship believe the same doctrine and we're going to the same heaven and there's always rank always conflict always disagreement always division always whatever it is you cannot live peaceably with those people who are near to you read the bible with you believe the word of god with you how can you live peaceably with all men and, and you can you can tell somebody has not uh, gotten married you're still a young lady and you're still looking up to the lord but you know every little thing offends you in the fellowship that's my enemy in the fellowship that's my enemy that's my enemy and the men they see that and they see your attitude and you see that you wear your emotion on your skin it's like you know you're always moody and you're always you know dangerous and terrible because they all offend me nobody understands me i and live peaceably with all men and the same thing there are men that are just like that they wear the emotion on their sleeves you cannot get along with them if you mistakenly just uh, push them like this you want to push me down what did i do why did you do that and all the, and they begin to shout on you and they point fingers at your face you have to take your nose away let's say poke your nose uh, and they say anyway 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 i forgive you now but next time they are watching you. if you are not married yet those ladies are afraid that that man a little sin and you might always cut off your head and what he did in the papers how you know something happened and then this person got rid of that i don't want that to happen to me it will not happen to me I'm talking about myself. It will not happen to me. Uh -huh. that's, that's why it says if you're a Christian, you show the mild nature of Christ and the loving nature of Christ and the gentle nature of Christ. And you say that love, everybody will see it. You know, if you were a boxer before, boxing is gone. Give me a good amen. amen. If you're a wrestler before, I will show them. Huh? You don't have anything to show anymore because that nature and characteristic of boxing and wrestling, all that is gone away. Then you are now a child of God and you have the heart of Christ and the heart of love and the heart of gentleness. And it says over here that as it is possible, as much as lies in you, in your power, live peaceably with all men. It says, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. Dearly beloved, tell me. Dearly beloved, say it aloud. Dearly beloved, say it again. I do you know there are people that, you know, teeth for tat. You do that for me. I know how to do that too. You use that kind of language on me. I'll tell you. I know what's vocabulary in the dictionary. I'll dig them out and throw them at you. There are people who call themselves Christians. Retaliation and revenge and what other people have done to them they throw it back if you throw more than them accidentally mistakenly they say i'll show you then they go and take something harder they throw it at you and they almost break your why did they do that to me eh, how about you what you did two days ago i forgot 
you do your own now now it comes to my turn and you are complaining that's not christianity christianity is is done that to me forgive them father they know not what they do and if a person is in the habit in the mind of retaliating 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 and it becomes your habit it becomes your lifestyle it becomes your very heart and you're going to lose the very nature of christ and you're going to lose the attribute of christ that's why it says dearly beloved avenge not yourselves and it says neither give place unto wrath unto anger unto bitterness unto hatred it says for it is rich in vengeance is mine i will repay says the lord therefore if thine enemy hunger tell me feed him if thine enemy hunger now don't look now if you are going to answer you look up at me if your enemy hunger feed him ah look at this the husband said something I did it like. And I'm the wife. You know, I'm making illustration. I'm not your wife. And then, uh, ah, honey, when are we going to take dinner? Dinner? I will go to the kitchen today and cook for a person like you, rascal like you. You know how to eat. Me, not me. Today, go there yourself and go and cook. If your enemy hunger, hey, my husband, the money food has finished. And we need such and such an amount now. Hey, go and get it. Money for food. There are some women. They never obey husband. We tell them, do this. They never do it. Do this. They never do it. Now they're asking for chop money. No money. Today, you will submit. After submission, money will come. If your enemy hunger, and you do that cheerfully, be Christian. And all these uh, things that have come in, that came in from tradition, that came in from all the backyard of the unbelievers, we throw them away tonight in Jesus' name. There will be peace in our families. There will be love in our families. And there will be love that shares in fellowship with everyone in our families in Jesus' name. Because it says, therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, tell me, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. For, and then it says, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good god will help us in jesus name i'm looking at i'm looking at first peter chapter 3 and i'm looking at verse 9 first peter chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 9 first peter chapter 3 we're looking at verse 9 it says not rendering evil for evil never never not rendering evil for evil i'll punish him i'll oppress him I will uh, kind of, uh, I would destroy him. He knows how to, you know, hurt other people. I will show him that, me too, I know how to hurt people. Only I was, I've been waiting. Don't, you know, keep on waiting. Never do that. It says, uh, you are not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrary wise blessing. Knowing that ye are their ways called, there unto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. I pray that this characteristic the Lord will give to every one of us in Jesus' name. And then we're looking at Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter, uh, we're reading from, let's look at this, Proverbs. It tells us in uh, Proverbs, uh, we're looking at chapter 25. Proverbs chapter 25, and I'm reading here from verse 21. Proverbs chapter 25, from verse 21. If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. Give him bread to eat. Give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head. And tell me the rest. And the Lord shall do what? 
and the Lord shall reward you. What does that mean? How does the Lord reward somebody for heaping coals of fire upon? He said, because his heart is hardened. It's like wax. And it's hardened. And it's hardened in evil. It's hardened in wanting to do bad, bad things. And because of that, he's not hearing the word of God. He's not hearing whatever it is. And then he has this hatred in him and he's hardened with hatred. And then he shows that hatred to a child of God. And that person fed him while he was hungry. And that person gave him water while he was thirsty. And the bread and the water became like fire that brought him under conviction, that melted his heart. The preaching could not melt him, and the commandment could not melt him, and whatever it is what he could not melt him, but this goodness and this kindness melted his heart like fire melts iron, like it melts the wax, and then he repents to the Lord, before the Lord, and gave himself to the Lord, and then the Lord said, you are the one. Preaching could not catch him. And all the ministry could not catch him. But your goodness, your feeling caught him. And now he's born again. And the Lord will reward you in Jesus' name. It tells us uh, in uh, chapter 24. Look at this. Chapter 24 of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 24. And I'm reading from verse 8. 1 Samuel chapter 24. And we're reading from verse 8. It is the story about uh, David and Saul. And Saul was, uh, you know, harassing the life of David and making David run helter-skelter. And then David had the chance that if he wanted to kill him, he could have killed him, but he did not. And this is the illustration we're talking about. First Samuel chapter 24, I'm reading from verse 8. And David also arose up to watch and went out of the cave and uh, cried after Saul, saying, My Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stood with his face to the earth and bowed himself. And David said unto Saul, Wherefore? Hearest thou the men's words, saying, Behold, David seeketh thy heart. Behold, this day thine eyes have seen how that the Lord had delivered thee this today into mine hand in the cave. And some bid me kill thee, but mine eyes spare thee. And I said, I will not put forth my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, see, ye, see the skirt of thy robe in my hand, for in that I cut off the skirt of thy robe and killed thee not, that know thou and see that there is neither evil nor transgression in mine hand, and I have not sinned against thee, yet thou huntest my soul to take it. And the Lord judge you no know, he went on uh, to talk about how the lord will respond to everything let's look at verse 16 now in verse 16 and it came to pass when david had made an end of speaking though these words unto saul that saul said is this thy voice my enemy david what my son David you know he counted him as enemy but now that act of kindness and that act of goodness had changed him said that is my son David and so lifted up his voice tell me tell me out loud his heart was melted that's what you're talking about when when your enemy does evil to you, he even wants to kill you and destroy your life, and you find him, and instead of repaying him evil for evil, you do good unto them, you melt their hearts, and then they weep like babies, like Saul wept over there. That's what the Lord is saying to us, that when your enemy hungers, you'll do what? And when they are thirsty, you'll do what? You'll give them drink. And this is what the Lord is uh, reminding us, that we need to return. Instead of returning hatred for hatred, 
that's a beastly nature that's human weakness that's a human depravity but instead of that acting like the natural people always angry always bitter always hateful always revengeful instead of having you know, acting like people who are always holding grudges against people and keeping malice it says that we shall have the strength of character and the courage of love that will return their evil with goodness and that we confront all the evil they do or the kindness of the Lord. We meet hatred with love. And then we respond to their wrongdoing with right appreciation and with right action and with right attitude. And we will not be, that will be like the coals of fire upon their head. And then their hearts will be melted and they will be in submission to the Lord. And the love of God will walk in our lives to transform transform the lives of all these enemies and opposers in Jesus name as we round up let me let me go to Romans now Romans I'm reading from chapter 5 Romans we're looking at chapter 5 Romans chapter 5 I'm reading from verse 5 Romans talking to us about love in Romans chapter 5 verse 5 it says uh, hope maketh not ashamed because the love of tell me the love of God is shared abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. It tells us that this love we're talking about is the love of God. This goes beyond human love, natural love. This goes beyond the love of people who are not born again, but the people who are born again, they have the love of God. Look at verse 8. It says, For God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, tell me, Christ died for us. It says this is the kind of love he wants us to manifest it is the love of God. Not only the love of God, the love of Christ. I'm looking at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, I'm looking at verse 35. Romans chapter 8 verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? From the love of Christ shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written for thy cause for thy sake we are killed all the day long we are counted as sheep for the for the slaughter nay in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Number one, the love of God. Number two, the love of Christ. We're coming to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, I'm, to, I'm reading from verse 30. Romans chapter 15, verse 30. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit. For the love of the Spirit. It talks about the love of God, God the Father. It talks about the love of Christ, the Son of God. And it talks about the love of the Spirit. Trinitarian love. Coming from the Father, coming through Jesus and coming by the ministration of the Holy Spirit. We're coming to chapter 12. Chapter 12, I'm reading from verses 9 and 10. Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another. With what kind of love? Brotherly love. The love of God, that's in Romans. The love of Christ, that's in Romans. The love of the Spirit, that's in Romans. And the love of the brethren, the love of brothers and sisters. Uh, that's uh, chapter 12. Look at chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 8. Chapter 13, verse 8. Oh, no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another. Another has fulfilled the Lord. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love, tell me, thy neighbor as thyself. You know what Romans is talking about? Romans is talking about the love of God. It's talking about the love of Christ. It's talking about the love of the Spirit. It's talking about the love of the brethren. And it's also talking about the love of our neighbors. And it says this kind of love should continue. Look at verse 10. It says love walketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And then 
when we have this love, something good will always happen to you. I said something good will always happen to you. Look at Romans chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 28. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know. And we know certainly. And we know definitely. And we know assuredly. And we know that all things work together for good to them that to them that to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. It says, let this love of God be shed abroad in your heart. The love of God, the love of Christ, the love of the spirit and the love of the brethren and the love of our neighbors and then you conquer by this and then it says all things in your life will work for good. Walk by love. Whatever other people do, however other people act, whatever it is they are manifesting, you know that your calling is walk in love and walk in love and walk in love and good will always happen to you in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. That what the Lord has spoken about today, costly love, compassionate love, courageous love, will walk in your life and that you will manifest this everywhere you find yourself and this love will be practical. This love will be purposeful. This love will be preeminent in your life. It will be on and on and on. Never hatred, never animosity and never anything that is negative. Let the love begin today and distribute to the necessity of the saints, necessity of the people around you. Let this love be manifest everywhere. 